Good afternoon, everyone. I am Javier Ors Ausin, Program Manager at World Monuments Fund, and I am very pleased to welcome all of you to today's event, which is our very first event of a new World Monuments Fund virtual series called On My Watch. The On My Watch series is a way of connecting the WMF community with architects, urban planners, preservationists, policymakers, and other stakeholders to really explore together the political, social, and technical issues facing heritage sites included in the World Monuments Watch, which is our global nomination-based program that seeks to discover a spotlight and take action on behalf of heritage sites facing challenges or presenting opportunities um, that connect directly to our global society. I would like to mention uh, that today's program is uh, co-hosted in partnership with the American Institute of Architects with the New York, New York chapter, particularly with our friends from the Historic Buildings Committee from AIA New York. So if you are joining today for credits, a link will be posted in the chat box towards the end of the program so you can complete the form. I would also like to remind everyone that the chat function will be available for you to share comments, to write questions that we will try to address towards the end of the program once we get to the Q&A section. And now let's focus on today's topic, which is uh, focusing on Ontario Place. For those of you who don't know Ontario Place, it's a public site and a modernist icon uh, located in Toronto, in Canada, designed in the early 1970s by architect Everhard Seiler and landscape architect Michael Hoff, who both envisioned an expansive public park on artificial islands on Lake Ontario. Ontario Place was included in the 2020 World Monuments Watch as a response to the provincial government of Ontario opening the site to international development calls in 2018 with no public uh, consultation or transparency, therefore opening the door to the possible demolition of the site or privatization of the land. After the watch inclusion, we, the World Monuments Fund, started working with the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario and the Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design at the University of Toronto on a project that we launched in October, last October, called The Future of Ontario Place. The Future of Ontario Place is an initiative aiming to both grow awareness of the importance of Ontario Place and also to protect its future through a research initiative, a public campaign, and a Canada-wide design challenge that is involving all the schools of architecture in the country for the first time ever. And before I continue to tell you a bit more about Ontario Place and introduce you to the panelists, I would like you to see a short video that will brief you, introduce you to the importance of Ontario Place. Ontario Place is worth protecting because it, it, it truly is a treasure as a cultural artifact from a really important period of the city's history. Uh, it represents a unique collaboration of architect Eberhard Zeibler, landscape architect Michael Huff, uh, producing something of enduring beauty. But then looking to the present, it is an extremely valuable resource for a city that has grown exponentially over the decades since its creation. There is an incredible need for public space, for green space in this city. And if 
recent events like COVID have not articulated that, um, then we're really blind. And this space is incredibly successful in its use. It's providing an essential service to a lot of the citizens within a city that's growing with increasing density. I think the strong attachment many people have to Ontario Place right now is about memory. Memory undoubtedly has a lot to play with the way public spaces work in cities. And the idea of everything from the chance romance to whatever having occurred at Ontario Place is part of its history. I think more than ever we realize uh, its value as a public space, as a public park, that we don't really need to do all that much for the space to have the value that is already you know, inherently here. We've lost the vision about a wonderful public space, um, something for everyone, uh, not just for people who have a lot of money who can go down and do something on the waterfront. It was for everybody. Right now, we're fighting against a group that is not interested in listening to the people, and that's the government of Ontario, unfortunately. They, have, they won't meet with anybody. They won't talk to anybody. Huge groups have formed asking to speak to them to explain their vision, what they feel the issues are. They're not interested. It is such a unique example of a particular form of avant-garde architecture, and there are only a handful of them in the world. And if you have one, why wouldn't you keep it? So it is in this context that we convene today's discussion. And I am very pleased to now introduce you to today's panelists because they each bring a very different and unique angle to Ontario Place and to this conversation. So let me start with Asisa. Asisa Chauni is an architect based in Toronto and Morocco and founding principal of Asisa Chauni's projects. Uh, Asisa is also an assistant professor at the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture landscape and design at the University of Toronto. And she's also one of the project leads of the Future of Ontario Place, alongside George Bird from the University of Toronto and Bill Graves from the Architectural Conservancy Ontario. Hi, Asisa, really good to see you. Hello, Javier, how are you doing? Good. Um, Ken, Ken Greenberg is an urban designer, teacher, writer, and former director of urban design and architecture for the city of Toronto. Ken is also the principal of Greenberg Consultants. And Ken is also a local Torontonian and a member of the organization Ontario Place for All, which advocates for Ontario Place to remain as a public park accessible to everyone. Hi, Ken. Hi there. And finally, Charles, Charles Stankiewicz. He is a Canadian artist and director of the Visual Studies program at the Faculty of Architecture, where he is an associate professor at the University of Toronto. Charles' work has been exhibited internationally in many parts of the world, including the Venice Architectural Biennale, among many other uh, biennales. And he, in fact, did an installation at Ontario Place in 2019. So I hope we'll be able to, to talk about that. Hi, hi, Charles. Hi. Great, thanks. So, Bye. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the panel. I am really happy to see you all here, to see your faces. You are in different parts of the world right now. Um, and I would like to start with you, Asisa, since uh, I see you here in front of me, uh, to really uh, talk a little bit about the future of Ontario Place Project and what we are trying to, to achieve with that. So please go ahead. 
Uh, very good. So first of all, um, th thank you so much for your kind uh, invitation. I'm very excited actually to be uh, here among you because I was caught in a flood. Uh, I'm in Morocco and Morocco's experience uh, an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented flood over the entire country. So I was able to make it uh, safely three minutes before the start of, of this conference. Uh, so uh, if you can maybe share, yes, okay. So my slides are shared. So uh, today I only have five minutes, it's very short. So I'm gonna uh, kind of go to, uh, uh, very quickly through my slide to give you a taste of the, uh, uh, the initiative that Javier has mentioned to you, please. Uh, next slide. But before uh, for doing so, I would like to take a minute uh, to actually state the uh, acknowledgement of traditional land. Uh, so acknowledge the land we are meeting on uh, virtually, uh, uh, which is an entire place, that it is on uh, the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Shipewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Thank you. Next, please. So the future of uh, Ontario Place Project is an initiative that we started in June 2020. Uh, next, please. As uh, a three-partite uh, initiative, uh, that include the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design at the University of Toronto, the World of Monuments Fund, as well as the Architectural uh, Conservancy of Ontario. And I would like to also uh, acknowledge the support of many other groups, uh, chiefly Ontario Place uh, for All, that's uh, represented today by, by Ken Greenberg. And the goal of this uh, initiative was uh, multifold. We wanted to take this opportunity to gather all of our expertise to, um, to actually collect all of the archive and all of the information that uh, treat of, uh, of Ontario Place and to also trace its uh, evolution uh, through time uh, of, of all the way to its uh, status today. Um, next, please. And uh, the team of the project includes uh, George Baird, uh, as well as myself, and Javier uh, Ors Orsin, as well as uh, William Greaves. And I would like to mention also Dana Salama, who's a project manager, as well as a very diverse team of, of undergraduate and graduate students at the University of Toronto. Next, please. And uh, just a very quick uh, introduction about uh, Ontario Place. Um, so for those of you that are not from uh, uh, Toronto, it is uh, a site of the waterfront of, of Toronto, loca located on the southwest uh, side of Lake uh, Ontario. And it is composed of five artificial islands that were built in 19, uh, you know, like uh, actually starting in the late uh, 60s and they opened in 1971. Um, and on top of the uh, islands are a series of different buildings that I'm going to, to mention shortly. Next, please. And the mastermind behind this uh, project is Abe uh, um, uh, Zeidler, who is actually still alive, and uh, who actually envisioned uh, Ontario Place as a, a futuristic megastructure floating on top of Lake Ontario and interconnected with these five uh, artificial islands. And I just wanted to briefly mention that uh, Ontario Place uh, came about in a a period and in an era of uh, such large megastructure project and as a direct response to Expo 67 in uh, Montreal. Uh, next, please. And it was uh, imagined uh, before all as a public space for all, uh, and uh, especially for Torontonians and that did not have access to a, a summer cottage. So it was meant to be a, a leisure ground of, of open for all that allows for a direct uh, interaction with the water. And the landscape architect was uh, Michael Hoff, and in a very innovative uh, fashion for the time, he decided to integrate native species within the landscape and deep ecology of those five uh, artificial islands. And one other um, very interesting component is the children's village, uh, a, a, an incredible play area designed by uh, Eric McMillan, who's the father of so soft play. Next, please. 
So first, I wanted to mention what makes Ontario Place such a significant uh, uh, place and why it is so important for us to uh, care for it and to think about its future and to uh, preserve it for future generations. So um, those are four, maybe there are many, but those are the four uh, most important features of uh, um, significance for me and, and for the group. One is that is one of the very few 1960s mega structure typology that was uh, ever built on uh, water. The second is that it has a very unique uh, integration between its landscape components, its architecture, and the context of Lake uh, Ontario. Uh, third is that its uh, architecture uh, was, uh, even for the time, but, uh, but uh, of all the way until today, has very uh, uh, innovative uh, features, um, constructive features, and, and detailing uh, features, and those include the Cinesphere, Five Pods, the Commons, the Children's Village, and the uh, Outdoor uh, Forum, and uh, its landscape design as well. And finally, uh, one of the key aspects of its um, significance is that it is a public space on the Toronto waterfront that's accessible to all. Next, please. And here is an image of the Cinesphere, which is still in use today, not uh, uh, extensively. And uh, at the time in 1971, it hosted the first ever IMAX show. And that was, and, and so the first show was actually viewed by 1.1 uh, million visitors. Next, please. The famous pods uh, that, according to Ab Zeidler's, were uh, actually um, that he got uh, inspiration from uh, old drills and from the the crystal uh, the Crystal Palace as well as the Eiffel Tower. So they're suspended over the water on these pylons and sustained by uh, cables. Next, please. The commons, which are uh, modular buildings that were meant to uh, receive uh, several sets of uh, flexible programs, so restaurant shops, and so forth. So the commons is still lightly used. Uh, the pods, I forgot to mention, are closed today. Next, please. The forum, which is this incredible um, structure that was hosting uh, about 8,000 people, was unfortunately demolished. Next, please. And the, the children's village that uh, was so innovative for the time since it's uh, initiated the, 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 the typology of, of soft play. And for many Torontonians uh, that actually uh, use this as um, children, keep very, very uh, keen uh, memories. It was demolished, unfortunately. Next, please. The landscape design that was extremely uh, innovative also for the time because of its use of native uh, um, species of Ontario. Next, please. And uh, very quickly, uh, the three themes of our research that are showcased on the website of the project, which is the future of Ontarioplace.org, that I would recommend that, that you go look at uh, for more uh, details and to go more in depth. Next slide, please. And, and so this is how we've organized all of the research that, that, that we've been undertaking. So in the explore theme, we have the timeline, the site, the archives and the interviews. In the imagine theme, we have the, the design challenge, which is a student competition that I'm going to touch upon, but also the submit an idea uh, feature with, with that allows for the public to partake in the future of the uh, place and to submit their own suggestions. And finally, the, the uh, connect theme in which the, the public, and I do encourage you, please go sign a letter to support um, the, um, the, the, the preservation of the site and for it to remain a public amenity. And finally, we are featuring also events that, that, that uh, we have led so far. Next, please. So I'm just going to go very quickly next, please, through the explore. I know that I don't have much time. So for the timeline, we start from the Toronto Purchase in um, 1700s, uh, next, uh, all the way to uh, the, the naming of Ontario Place to the World Monuments uh, Watch in 2020, next. And one interesting feature of our timeline was that we are allowing the public to submit uh, his or her own memory um, to the timeline. So you can view the timeline with all of these additions of the uh, 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 visitors to the website. Next, please. And we traced in a very rigorous manner uh, the evolution of the site, which was a set of drawings that were never done before, where we located what was the original design, both for the landscape and for the architecture. You can see here highlighted in red, the five uh, famous spots. And right south of them, you have the, the Cinesphere, which is the, the circle that, that you can see south of them. Next. 
So within DEEF Evolution, we were uh, able to assemble this final map that shows in different tones of orange, all of the different buildings that were added as well as some of the buildings, unfortunately, that were demolished. Next, please. And we went into more detail into each one of the architecture components. We detailed its own, uh, 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 its architecture, its detailing and its um, structural um, systems. You can see some of the plots and villages. Next, please. And finally, the archive, which was, uh, you know, again, a very uh, difficult process since we didn't have much fun for the copyright, but we're very lucky to get the um, support of many people to be able to assemble it. So you can actually go through and uh, browse um, uh, through it. Next, please. And the interviews are also a set of different, um, you know, interviews of uh, people involved in uh, on the design of entire place or even stakeholders that, that we have also made available that we're able to, to in a way share their own history and their own experience of entire place. Next, please. Uh, very quickly, the imagine next. The, the, we have the design challenge, which is a student competition. It's a Canadian-wide um, uh, competition that's open to um, um, students of architecture, landscape, and urban design and uh, related fields, but also recent graduates. So the, the deadline just passed, and we're very, very happy to have uh, received um, uh, you know, kind of many contributions, and, and the uh, results are going to be uh, showcased and announced in February. Next, please. And we're very lucky to have a very exciting uh, panel of jury members. Next, please. And the submit uh, an idea feature was very important for us since we were allowing process that the central government did not take into consideration was very simply to ask the current user Site, but also uh, Torontonians, what they thought of the future of this place that many of them um, cherish. And I invite you to go um, and check some of the suggestions. One, so this one is mine. I admit to reopen the bar on the terrace of the pots where you get a very beautiful view of uh, the city, of the scan of the city. Next, please. Next. Thank you. And finally, the connect. Next, so I'm going to be uh, here using this opportunity uh, to um, inform you about this letter and please, uh, you know, like after this event, go and sign the letter because we do need your support. So this letter is a response to the announcement of the Ontario provincial government led by Doug Ford in 2018 to redevelop the site and to, uh, to actually open the, the site for, for, for development with no public consultation and no transparency whatsoever, which is a very undemocratic uh, uh, process. And so now Ontario Place is at risk of uh, privatization and losing its world-renowned architecture and landscape um, heritage. Next, please. So uh, please uh, go online and then sign this letter of support if you can. Next, please. Some of the events uh, that we did, but also I would like to uh, point your attention to the fact that we're gonna have a symposium in, in February uh, about Ontario Place, next. And finally, I just wanna end very quickly about what now, you know, the future of Ontario Place, what can we envision and what's lacking and what can we ask the uh, provincial government to do next. Well, for starters, uh, we need a conservation management plan for any heritage uh, place around the world, even 20th century um, heritage, one needs a conservation management plan to guide, which is a guiding document for the conservation and management of the architecture and of the, the landscape. And um, I just very quickly wanted to mention that it has five uh, phases in, in general, one which is the documentation and data collection, uh, which we have started, uh, and there is the establishment of uh, significance, which is again a process that needs to involve a wide array of stakeholders. Then there is a diagnosis and conservation uh, strategies and policies, and finally the application. So technically, this process should have happened before any call for, for development, and also uh, the call for development should have not only been based on the CMP, but also should have involved the uh, public and Torontonians and be transparent and democratic. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Asisa. Uh, such a great overview of the project. And I 
truly hope we will be able to see a conservation management plan uh, being developed for Ontario Place. We'll, we'll talk more about that during the discussion. I now want to uh, pass it to Ken and give you, Ken, the opportunity to share with everyone your view on Ontario Place and also the activities that Ontario Place for All has been developing since the organization was created. So please go ahead, Ken. Thank you very much, Javier. And it's really a pleasure to participate with the world's monument, World Monument Fund and our other partners in this webinar and in the effort um, to make the real value of Ontario Place understood. Uh, as Aziza pointed out, this is a unique example of mid 20th century modernism. It is truly at a crossroads, uh, both in peril, I might say, and uh, with the opportunity to play an extraordinary new role in this next stage of the evolution of the city. Next. I think it's important to go back to that moment uh, when Ontario Place was conceived in the aftermath of Expo 67 in Montreal. Uh, it was a period of enormous optimism in Canada and great interest in design. And this sketch by Eb Zeidler makes the point that it, this extension of the Lake Ontario shoreline was seen as urban parkland with its islands, with its canals, with its structures, a new hybrid, very unusual for the time kind of park. Next. Um, and to make that happen, the province of Ontario called upon two of the great talents in our midst, Everhard Zeidler, whose firm uh, was doing these extremely interesting explorations of different types of structures, what I call the machine, and next, in the garden. And Michael Huff, who was one of the great leaders, not only locally, but internationally, in the movement uh, for landscape ecology, for working with nature in new ways, what we today call landscape urbanism. Next. Together, they created an extraordinary fusion of architecture and landscape. And I want to stress that this was a project of the conservative government of the day, the same government that is in power in Ontario today. <clears throat> so uh, Premier John Robarts uh, did the countdown in 1970. Uh, you can see the forum here in 1971. Bill Davis, a very popular conservative premier, actually opened the site and the ambitions were very large. And I'm just going to quote from part of this. There was a need for a place where we could examine our history, look at our culture and economic growth, and contemplate the challenges of the future. In short, we wanted a place to reaffirm our identity as Ontarians and Canadians. Next. Next came after a few years of great success, what I would call 50 years of wandering in the wilderness where various <clears throat> governments were trying to figure out how to treat Ontario Place, how to maintain it, what to do with it, uh, leading up right to the present moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in the midst of that, in 1997, I got involved in a very interesting study for the provincial government of the day, um, led by a uh, representative or represented by David Crombie, a former mayor of Toronto, and Joe Pantaloni, who was the head, the chair of the exhibition place board on behalf of the city of Toronto, looking at a merger of the two sites. Uh, and together they represent some 350 acres at a really strategic location. Unfortunately, though we came very close, that didn't happen. Next. But the reason that was considered is that in the 30 in intervening years, the city had grown enormously around Ontario Place and Exhibition Place, uh, moving from a, a time when they were truly isolated in a vast former industrial area to being right in the heart of the city. Next. So this, this was an image from that planning exercise that I was involved in. And the idea was of a great lakefront park combining the two sites 
transforming the surface parking lots into additional parkland, a land bridge over Lakeshore Boulevard, which had separated them, and bringing uh, the very popular Martin Goodman Trail, which runs along 20 kilometers of the Toronto waterfront right out to the edge of the water. Next. In 2017, the government again of the day started to implement incrementally what this new look at the site might look like and two firms uh, land inc uh, a local firm and west eight from rotterdam uh, teamed up to produce uh, what is called trillium park and the william g davis trail named for that former premier uh, which is next truly a remarkable, already well-loved space enjoyed by Ontarians with a strong emphasis on acknowledging our Indigenous past. Next. And in fact, there were plans in the wings to continue that reinterpretation of the landscape of Ontario Place, uh, which would have more than doubled uh, the area of Trillium Park. But unfortunately, that was aborted Next. And in 2018, something quite shocking happened. Uh, the provincial government announced essentially its intention to privatize Ontario Place, to turn it over to the private sector. And there were two things about this that were really disturbing to, uh, to us, which led to the creation of Ontario Place for All. One is after 20 years of a way of dealing with our waterfront led by Waterfront Toronto, a public agency representing three levels of government, federal, provincial, and municipal, with a strong emphasis on public engagement. This was all to be done secretly with non-disclosure and grievance, uh, with no access to the public to the creation of these plans. But secondly, and most disturbing, is the quote you see in red, uh, made by a minister of the government, and I'll just read it. The current state of Ontario Place is disgraceful and there is nothing that can be saved. We need to turn it into a world-class attraction. Nothing is off the table and the site will become more of an amusement destination than a waterfront one. Next. This led to an extraordinary mobilization, uh, the creation of Ontario Place for All, which has brought tens of thousands of Ontarians from all across the province, not just uh, locally in Toronto, to come together to rally for the preservation and survival of Ontario Place, and also brought the World Monuments Fund into the picture, looking at the value of the international heritage here. Next. Um, Ontario Place for All commissioned a study from uh, the New York firm HRNA, the world's leading specialist in analyzing the value, the economic value of public space. And they did a study for us demonstrating that if all you cared about was the bottom line, there is far more economic value in preserving Ontario Place as a public space than in any short-term monetization of it as a piece of real estate. Next. Um, its key role for me today is as a major linchpin along the entire waterfront. You see the Martin Goodman Trail uh, depicted in the image on the right. Literally today, tens of thousands of people, especially in this period of COVID, are traversing the waterfront all day long and taking advantage of Ontario Place, even in its neglected state, as a great public space. Next. And I'm going to end with this image, this po these poetic images of the extraordinary value that Ontario Place has uh, for the city, for the community, this boundless horizon, this opportunity, as in the original vision of Eb Zeigler and Michael Huff to relate to Lake Ontario in a rich and extraordinary way. Thank you very much. Back to you, Javier. Thank you, thank you, Ken. Well, such a great overview of all the things that have been happening recently at Ontario Place. We are a little behind, but I hope in the discussion, we'll have time to talk about that economic um, report because I'm actually curious to know how was um, 
taken by the by the government and if they have uh, if you have if you guys have had any discussion uh, about that with the government but i want to pass it now to uh, charles um hi charles um and really want you to tell us uh, your view on ontario place especially from you know your angle as an artist and the relationship between visionary design and public space uh, and art and also based on your experience uh considering that you did an installation there a couple of years ago. Thanks, Javier. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with um, all of you, Ken and Aziza, you, you great colleagues, and it's a real honor to be able to contribute to this conversation. It's a definitely a passion for all of us, including myself, and I've been lucky enough to actually engage the site as public programming. Um, this occurred because of the Toronto Biennial of Art. It was inaugurated actually just last year. Um, in its first instantiation. And they approached me to create the video and sound art component of the biennial. So I'm just gonna have some images kind of float in the background while I speak of the event and a couple of historical ones. Uh, when they approached me, I immediately knew that I wanted to engage the Cinesphere, particularly at Ontario Place as the site for the project. Um, and this was because, and the reason why they asked me to participate in the biennial and I wanted to decide is because of my history doing in interventions in modernist architecture, uh, probably most recently, and what put me on their minds was the commission I had for the Musée d'Art Contemporain um, and the commission for the 50th anniversary of Expo 67, where I turned um, Buckminster Fuller's geodesic dome for the American Pavilion into an actual radio antenna by electrifying the entire metal lattice work. Um, in conjunction with an archival exhibition at the museum. So it was kind of, as we've already kind of mentioned in this talk today, a certain precursor for thinking about experimental architecture, thinking about sites within the Canadian landscape that are important to our heritage, but also important to an international conversation about architecture and media and landscape. And there really isn't a better site, in my opinion, than Ontario Place to discuss those issues. As Isa already mentioned, it's not only the first place for IMAX film representation, but it was the first permanent home of IMAX. It's a custom built cinema um, that was designed by Ab Zeidler for this reason. Um, and the images of the, the film that was expressed north of Superior by Graham Ferguson that had the over 1 million views was um, an important aspect within the history, not only of experimental mega structures, but in the history of image making. As we all know, IMAX is still the paragon when it comes to filmmaking. I saw Tenant this summer quickly in a socially distanced moment at Ontario Place this summer. And so it's really important as an artist, as, a, as the director of visual studies to uh, address these issues of media culture and particularly within the concept of architecture and landscape. Um, so uh, the drawing that just flipped by actually is a sketch by Graham Ferguson. I wanted to put that in there as an inversion actually of the conversation. This is a, a graphic rendering of Expo 67's dome to turn it into an Omnimax theater based on Ontario Place. So I, I thought I'd have a little fun throwing the inversion because the narrative's always 67 to the 71, but actually after it burned down and the uh, plastic facade of Expo 67 and there was the conversation of artist revitalizations of that site, Graham Ferguson actually proposed this mega theater, um, maybe perhaps a little bit uh, too experimental and mega for the site itself. Um, but it's an interesting kind of narrative and this idea of programming activating really important historical sites. And so I took that lead for a project called The Drowned World. Um, it was immediately came to mind once I was thinking about what to do for the biennium and what to do to activate this space. Water, of course, is one of the most important conversations that we can have today. And uh, the archipelago that was designed by Michael Hoff and Zeidler together is an important uh, piece of that puzzle of the future conversation. I could have curated, of course, a, a video program or film program uh, in a cineplex down the street, let's say on Richmond or on Spadina or something. But the idea of doing it at Ontario Place is really important. And that's my argument here, is that the programming uh, of Ontario Place is inspired by its original artistic creation. The design aspect by Ebb and Michael was incredibly successful and its legacy power is this artistic gesture, I think. It's experimental nature. 
it's one thing to be programming something in an industry related uh, film and video festival, which, you know, obviously TIFF is very successful internationally. But we also need these places where an experimental voice, where we can actually be inspired and create new work that is just as important in regards to furthering these conversations. So what you're looking at is a bunch of films that include, uh, uh, as you're seeing there, a photograph of uh, a palm plantation in Indonesia. This is a mine in the Congo. Images of seed vaults um, in the Arctic. All of these combined together because we not only treated the cinema as an exhibition site for films, we treated it as a site that was a destination. The also the approach to the uh, project itself before the cinema included that important pod walkway, the gateways you can see there, the bridge going across the water. We had sound installations by a Sami indigenous artist um, passing through the seasons because the biennial, of course, was quite long. Uh, so it was summer when it started and winter when it finished. So we had these kind of ecosystems shifting in regards to the environmental changes outdoors. We also commissioned a custom scent. It was one that was with Comme de Garçon and the Finnish designer Villa Kokonen of the Tega Forest. So you actually uh, smelled a certain scent as you approached and entered into the cinema. And then most uniquely, we actually repurposed the entire IMAX system, not only as a projection system for images, but as a surround sound system to create sound installations that were incredibly powerful and immersive, something you never really can do in a museum because it's not built for this sonic super structure. We had included uh, historical aspects such as the very first recordings of the World Soundscape Project of ocean recordings, all the way up to new commissions that were actually working with um, the sonic components and the history of legacy of experimental avant-garde music. And so I want to really keep to my five minutes and I, I want to just kind of end by saying we really wanted to feel that this architecture inspired these works that actually was a continuation of this experimental voice and not only including the historical aspect, it is a monument, it's, it's amazing the monument fund has uh, taken the site on in regards to history and media like IMAX and experimental mega structures like um, was at the time in the 1670s, but it's also the site to really push contemporary conversations. It's on the site of the greatest freshwater system in the world, the Great Lakes, and the idea of it floating on an archipelago as a cinema allowed us to push the conversations of what water means today from an indigenous perspective, from an ecological perspective, from an economic and geopolitical perspective. And so this site is unique in inspiring those conversations and also hosting it. And so it would be important for us to preserve that, to look backwards, but also to look forwards in what we need to critically address through our architecture and cultural programming. Thanks, Samia. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And thank you, Asisa. Thanks, Ken. Well, you know, I think the next installation you do at Ontario Place should be at the pods. I haven't been inside because they, they have been closed for a number of years, unfortunately, but I've heard that the space inside is absolutely beautiful and you really get a nice overview of Toronto. So let's let's aim for that maybe something to incorporate in the in the conservation management plan when that when that happens i want to open the conversation now to the three of you um but before we jump in the conversation in the conversation i want to acknowledge that since you know when the first time we spoke about this webinar and to start putting it together there has been a change there has been a change in in toronto the provincial government of ontario did a statement a few days ago, uh, saying specifically, and I'm going to read it, that key heritage and recreational features will remain, such as the Cinesphere, the Pots, Trillium Park, and the William G. Davis Trail. I believe this is the first time they do a statement like this and that they include even the Pots when they speak about preserving features at Ontario Place. So I want the three of you to reflect on this and share with everyone what are your first kind of reactions to, to this statement. We can start with you, Ken. Yeah, I mean, this is not the first time, uh, especially in this period, that governments have taken a short-sighted view around um, monetizing assets quickly and not seeing their longer-term value. And I, I think it's a great sign that the government seems to be listening to some extent, as you say, Javier, that's the first acknowledgement we've had of the value. 
But I, I think what the public is trying to say to the government is that you have something here, we have something here of enormous value culturally, from a heritage standpoint, from a public realm standpoint, and even from an economic standpoint, as the HRNA study demonstrated, that for you, the government is hidden in plain sight, but we all see it. And hopefully this effort, this project uh, that is being undertaken, the competition, the seminars, uh, the increasing attention, I would urge everybody to get involved with all of these, to get on the Ontario Place for, for All site and sign up. Uh, governments do change their minds. And this will not be the first time. We've had several misadventures on the Toronto waterfront where we had narrow escapes from really bad ideas. And hopefully this will be another case where um, a more thoughtful consideration can prevail. Uh, one thing that I would like maybe to mention, I would like to, to second what Ken said, but I would like to state that what the government is proposing is absolutely not enough. If we look very closely at the genealogy, let's say of the attitude towards Ontario Place, it went from there's nothing to save to and, and, uh, and that all is up for grabs for the developers to let's add only the sinosphere, maybe we save it to let's add now the, the pods. But actually what is totally missing is that it is the entire site, uh, including uh, its landscape, including the relationship of its uh, of architecture with the landscape and with the water, but also the fact that it is a public space uh, that should all be taken into consideration. So I think this is what I call the, the spirit of Ontario Place. And I think singling out buildings to be preserved and maybe repurposed is certainly not enough as guidelines or as constraints for the developers. So, uh, so I think that's my immediate uh, reaction to the statement or to, to the current status. But I remain also optimistic that since we've seen progress, it means that if the public, if all of you and, and more people support Entire Place for All, or even you know like the, the future of Entire Place, or or contact your uh, MP, I'm, maybe you can call me too much of an uh, optimist, but I do believe I shared the the, the uh, belief with Ken that the uh, public and that the voices of the public uh, could sway the current uh, provincial uh, government. Yeah, I want to just echo everyone else. In, in some regards, of course, it's encouraging governments to change. Um, if anything, we've seen declarations of history that got erased, uh, literally deleted, um, and statements before, uh, and heritage kind of uh, proclamations. So I think it's important we just keep on it. I think it's a, it's a moment to grab as optimism as moving in the right direction. I think maybe this is one of the benefits of, of COVID is suddenly public spaces like this and the, the supercharged use of it this summer has drawn attention to it. Not to mention, uh, I'm not involved, so I'm not biased here, but the, you know, the, the, the last uh, few months of these projects and conversations going, I think have really put pressure on the government. So in anything, I should just say that this is a moment to realize that hopefully we do have a voice and the events like this that we're doing really keep pressure on the government to keep moving forward to a goal that Aziza is really pointing out. There's a final goal for us to be pointing to and it's not enough, but it's part of the way there. Yeah, well, thank you. No, I, I agree. I think, you know, even if we are going in the positive direction, the, I, I, I think that we all agree that something that is missing here is the public participation. You know, they now include the pods and the sinosphere and other spaces, but you know, where are these ideas coming from, right? Where where are you know members of Ontario Place for All or ACO being uh, included in those discussions? So I think we should keep working towards the, that direction to make sure that there is a more inclusive uh, conversation, which is the title of this program. And I also want to talk now about you know we've been talking a lot about Ontario Place. That's the topic of the conversation. But I really want to contextualize Ontario Place in the larger context of modern architecture at large. And I, wanna, um, I want all of you to share your opinion on this, but I want to start with you, Asisa, because you have been working on modern sites around the world for years. You have developed conservation management plans for sites in different parts of the world. You are also part of the ECOMOS International Scientific Committee for 20th Century Heritage. Um, so I wanna hear from you, what is that is making modern architecture facing these issues all the time. We 
recently saw the announcement from the uh, IAM Ahmedabad about the Louis Kahn uh, dorms in the university. Um, so we keep seeing these issues again and again. Um, why is that modern architecture is lacking in uh, local appreciation and what can, what can we do to, to improve that? Well, I think that this question deserves an entire uh, webinar, but I'm going to try to answer it very shortly. Well, it's because mainly those are, or um, modern heritage or 20th century heritage is too recent. And there is uh, a lack of uh, awareness and a lack of appreciation. And, and actually one of the goal of the future of entire place was the raising of awareness and the, uh, of, the, of dissemination about the importance of this architecture. And I think, you know, in all of the different sites, you know, like across the world where uh, I work, uh, regardless of the uh, economic status of the country uh, or its uh, political um, history, uh, modern heritage has very uh, bad press. It's very unfriendly. It's seen as being very unfriendly, sometimes of, of out of scale, which sometimes modern uh, buildings are or have the, the tendency to be, but their uh, qualities are very often uh, ghosted. And, and I think that some of the challenges that I face in Morocco and Senegal and other places are very often the, the same, is that the uh, owners of the building, very often governments, like in Toronto, wants to monetize, wants to put a profit first. And if profit means to demolish the uh, building, then they would just uh, go ahead. So to answer very shortly your question, I think that there is a lack of appreciation of the values of uh, modern heritage uh, as a cultural um, asset. Any other reflections? Well, we can, we can, I, I, I am actually curious to know about uh, your opinion on something else. Um, you know, if we expand, uh, you know, the kind of reach of Ontario Place and moving beyond the artificial islands and looked at the area surrounding Ontario Place, uh, we get to this place called Exhibition Place. And I, I think Asisa is aware of this. The first time I went to Ontario Place, I was in downtown Toronto and I walked to the site and I crossed uh, Exhibition Place, which is this kind of a strange area. There's a highway that really kind of creates a wall between the urban fabric and Ontario Place. There are a lot of emptiness in a way, a lot of parking lots uh, that really don't help to make the space friendly and to really attract people. So what are your comments on uh, Exhibition Place? What exactly is Exhibition Place? And, what could be done to improve that connectivity between the rest of the city and, and the site? So Javier, I'm, I'm going to combine your question with one that I see on the chat, which is about the role of Waterfront Toronto. For those who are not from Toronto, we happen to have one of the best waterfront redevelopment agencies in the world, undertaking the biggest waterfront transformation project that's going on anywhere uh, with the recreation of a new river mouth and park system at the other side of the harbor. For the last 20 years, Waterfront Toronto, whose mandate actually includes the area of Ontario Place and Exhibition Place, extends just to the west of these two combined sites, has been doing a first-class job of engaging the public in all of this activity in every phase of the design with an excellent design review panel with many opportunities for the public to be involved. And what's so shocking and ironical is that in the same Toronto where we have that agency, we have this secretive back door, behind closed doors effort going on with non-disclosure agreements, solicitations to privatize the site with the, the public having zero understanding of what's going on and to date, the province has completely rebuffed all the efforts of Ontario Place for All to engage in a dialogue. Hopefully that will change. So I, I think, you know, in, as I pointed out in 1997, the idea of combining the two sites came very, very close to producing a merger around this big idea of a lakefront park embracing the two overcoming the barrier of Lakeshore, Lakeshore Boulevard. So many things have happened in the interim that would make that work even better. A new Ontario line subway by the provincial government coming to Exhibition Place, the idea of a shuttle 
that would combine the two sites. Um, we have all the conditions to make that a success. And the final thing I want to say is, and I, I very much enjoyed seeing Charles' ideas about the Cinesphere. The site is so interpretable. It's not that we want to freeze it in, you know, going back to what it was 50 years ago. Trillium Park demonstrated beautifully the idea of reinterpreting the landscape. The artifacts that were created by the Zeidler team show that they can do so many new things as we approach the challenges of the 21st century and the opportunities of the 21st century. So that, that vision that John Robarts talked about as a place of reflection is absolutely viable still. And I think maybe, you know, like if, if I might uh, uh, rebound on that and just uh, uh, answer some of the questions that repeat on the chat is one about what to do, what can we do, what type of uh, future can be, you know, like imagine for, for the site, uh, should private development be there or not? Well, one thing that I uh, can um, answer is that there are many options out there that before we go to the option, I think that the attitude of the provincial government has to change that we need to start a democratic process. I mean, I'm actually, I can mention, I'm utterly shocked how undemocratic in Canada today, a public site of this importance is undergoing. The lack of transparency, the lack of uh, involvement of, of the public, of stakeholders that are using the site. There are both community there, there are people that canoe, there are people that fish. They're not taken at all into consideration. So. I think that the first step is a change of attitude. A second one is to be able to list Ontario Place as heritage for it to be protected. A conservation management plan is going to establish what are the areas of significance, what are the levels of priorities, where development can occur. And then any type of format of public-private uh, partnership can happen, et cetera. But I think as long as a portion of Ontario Place, the, uh, let's say the spirit of it, the original goal of it, for it, like Ken mentioned, justly so, for it to remain a, a public park and a large uh, portion of it uh, remains. So it doesn't preclude development, maybe in certain parts, but I think all of the uh, elements that I mentioned uh, have to be put in place before one can even think of development of the site. And I, can we, I just add one thing to what Aziza said, the idea of the park, and this goes right back to the original vision in 1970, did not preclude things happening in that park which generate revenue, yeah. which have opportunities for all kinds of things that you wouldn't typically find in an early 20th century park. There was a very different idea expanding the whole notion. And this really came out of Expo 67 of a new form of park. So things like the children's village, things like the Cinesphere, things like uh, the uses of the pods and a whole host of new activities that one could imagine. The annual exhibition of the CNE uh, taking place within exhibition place would be uh, an extraordinary example of that. So this is a whole new way of thinking about what parkland can be. So we are actually reaching the end of the, of the program, but I want to say a couple of things. Everyone is talking about the next steps and follow-ups to the current situation. And I want to acknowledge and or repeat what Asisa was saying before, you know, one of the purposes of the future of Ontario Place has been to really look forward. And that's why we frame the design challenge in, as an opportunity for not only architects, but in fact, invite more people, urban planners, people from different disciplines, uh, students of different disciplines to be involved in those proposals. And, you know, as kind of next steps for us, um, you know, we will be announcing the, the winners of the design challenge in February during the symposium that Asisa was mentioning before. And we hope that some of the ideas that will emerge from those proposals will be part of the foundation of a future conservation management plan that hopefully will involve Ontario Place for All, will involve people from the University of Toronto, will involve people from the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario. So I really, I just want everyone to know that we are already planning next steps, but the reality is that we also need to get the government on board. That's really critical at this point. And, you know, before we uh, 
close the event, I want to ask all of you if you have any final remarks that you want to share with everyone be, before we fi finalize the, the program. I just want to answer the one question about, you know, the need for exhibition space within the city. I, I want to say that, you know, like there is an incredible desire to use the space um, from music festivals to light festivals and small pavilions um, to the biennial itself. I know we struggled even the first year to get access. And I, I know it was one of the primary sites that pretty much every artist uh, in a biennial internationally, when they heard we were in Toronto and we're talking, they all wanted to use Ontario Place. But the access to it was so precarious that planning on a, like a two year cycle is, is really difficult. The Sinister is a little different because it is one of the, the beacons of a, of a mixed kind of revenue based situation that we could step into with its recent renovation. but. It, the, the desires there internationally to do projects there um, through to a local situation. Um, so I think that's, that is really important to kind of highlight that it's, this is not an anomaly in any sense. It would, it's, it's definitely the desire from a professional standpoint of exhibition making. Yeah, I, I just wanna thank the World Monument Fund and our other partners for really focusing the spotlight on this. At the end of the day, the government is gonna be sensitive to two things. One, not being embarrassed internationally. And I, I think this event and the events that you're planning will play a significant role on um, calling their attention to something that they missed, unfortunately, but also locally, I think people who are on this webinar uh, from Ontario who are voters really have to speak out and engage with members of provincial parliament and government representatives at all three levels uh, to make them understand how much people truly care about Ontario Place. So once more, thanks. Thank you. Asisa, any final remarks? Add, yes, I just want to touch upon the uh, design challenge uh, and just to highlight the fact that it is a student or it was or still is a student competition idea competition and encourage the collaboration between disciplines and student across uh, Canadian schools. So we had a faculty member or two involved in every Canadian schools. And it was uh, the, the first time that all Canadian uh, design schools together rallied uh, behind a cause, a similar cause. And we're hoping to establish this as a model for other uh, buildings at risk in the future. But uh, the design challenge is meant to, of course, put some fresher new ideas on the table while uh, preserving the uh, heritage and in including the uh, stakeholders into consideration, but uh, by no means would it stand in lieu of a proper conservation management plan. So I would say that it's gonna plant the, the, the seeds of it. And uh, finally, I just want to thank Javier, but also telling you that the chats, I've been very busy with the chat, some, uh, I mean, some uh, very interesting questions, but mainly similar concerns. I've noted people from uh, Wagadougou, from Clichy, France, from New York, for, uh, from Colombia, and they were all asking questions. So Javier, if I may ask, maybe, I mean, I circulated my uh, email address. It would be fantastic if we could have a group so that we can continue to share similar uh, initiatives. And there was yes. just one, example here that was cited, which was as a very good and successful example of public-private uh, uh, partnerships uh, that engage the, uh, uh, the public for preservation, which is the Presidio in San Francisco. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Asisa. And thank you for taking care of the chat. I wasn't really able to follow all the questions, but I know that you've been answering some of them. And, you know, obviously an hour wasn't enough to really unpack and talk about everything about Ontario Place. But I'm really grateful to have had the three of you uh, talking about Ontario Place and hearing your ideas and your enthusiasm. Again, I wish we had two or three hours to keep discussing and, and also engage with, with the audience. But thank you. Thank you, Ken, Charles, and Asisa. Thank you. I would also like to thank the audience for being so engaged with the conversation and sharing so many questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't address all of them. Uh, but I hope you were inspired by, by this discussion. And I really encourage you to stay connected to World Monuments Fund, to the Future of Ontario Place project, to Ontario Place for All, and to the Architectural Conservancy Ontario. There's, there are many actors involved here, so stay connected to all of them and stay connected to the results of the design challenge because I know that we are going to get really great and interesting ideas. So I hope you will, you will uh, take a look at our website when, when they come out. I will also uh, love to remind everyone that nominations for the 
2022 World Monuments Watch are now open and they will be open until March 1st. The 2022 watch cycle really seeks to highlight, again, innovative solutions to some of the greatest challenges that heritage sites are facing and that include climate change, underrepresented narratives and imbalanced imbalance, balance tourism, excuse me. Uh, so if you stand with a heritage site and want to uh, World Monuments Fund engage with them, please consider to submit a nomination. You should join World Monuments Fund mission. And if you don't have a site, please spread the word so that we can really support sites around the world. And finally, one last announcement to, for everyone to stay tuned because there's an, an, another On My Watch uh, event coming up um, that will be focusing on the Sardar Vallabhai Patel Stadium in Ahmedabad in India. This is a post-independence cricket stadium designed by architect Charles Correa and engineer Mahindra Raj, where World Monuments Fund is developing in partnership with the Getty Foundation a conservation management plan. So very connected to what we were discussing today. So stay tuned because we will announce that program very soon. And I think that's it from my end. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope to see you again soon. Goodbye. And please sign the letter on our website.